Hello, everyone, and welcome to this course preview event for the summer term at Signum University's master's uh, degree in uh, language and literature. Uh, as well as doing all our wonderful space courses every month, we do um, master's level courses every term uh, in uh, language and literature, and we have four exciting courses to talk about today and representatives from all four courses to tell you a bit more about uh, what's in store for people who register to take one of these classes, whether as a credit student for their degree or diploma, or as an auditor, which means that you get to join in the class without having to do the assignments. Uh, my name is Gabriel Schenk, and I'm one of the teachers this term, and I'm joined with uh, the other teachers from this term as well. And term begins May the 1st, so you uh, still have time to sign up depending on when you're watching this. Uh, and I think you've got a, a few weeks even into the term to sign up as well, but it's much, much better if you sign up as soon as possible, uh, because then we can uh, take your schedule into account and get you into a live preceptor session uh, that suits you best. And also uh, you don't have to sort of catch up with work past the beginning of term. Uh, and then uh, after May the 1st, uh, the term lasts for 12 weeks. It's actually the summer term lasts for 13 weeks because we have a one week break in the middle uh, around the time of myth moot uh, in the the towards the end of June. So do check out the website for the exact dates for that. Uh, but it's 12 weeks of classes spread over 13 weeks. And uh, we're going to get cr cracking on uh, with uh, talking about these courses. If you're joining us live in the Zoom session, please put all your questions and your comments in the chat or the Q&A box. And if you're joining us on YouTube, uh, please leave your comments below and we'll try to get, uh, we'll try to respond to any questions that you leave us. But let's begin with uh, our very exciting latest new course, Tolkien Illustrated, picturing the Legendarium, which is going to be lectured on uh, by a brand new uh, lecturer for Signal University, uh, Joel Mariner. Um, Dr. Mariner, thank you so much for coming. Um, thank you for inviting me. Tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, uh, what well, you are, um, where you are. Where I am, I, I'm in Cornwall, so right down in the kind of farthest nether regions uh, of, of Britain. Uh, um, at the moment, I'm, I'm kind of working as uh, usually my day job. Uh, I'm an associate lecturer in art history at the University of Plymouth. I kind of teach. Uh, art historical methodologies, uh, visual culture, these kind of, um, uh, the history of illustration as well in the illustrated book. So this kind of meshes with my my research. My PhD was on, uh, um, people who know me will know that I'm a bit mad on Soviet block Tolkien illustration. So my PhD and my master's was uh, exploring that kind of very strange and uh, unusual world visually. So uh, yeah, which, uh, uh, I kind of <laughs> live and breathe Tolkien illustration. Uh, so it's kind of what I think about most of the times. So uh, yeah, this is a, very nice to be able to actually teach this course. I think one of the first courses of its kind. So I'm quite excited about this. Yeah, definitely. I mean, this is a literature course, but it's also kind of an art history course as well. Um, yeah, so it's, gonna, right? uh, it's very important, this kind of mesh of images and text, because this is what is at the heart of what illustration is, because it's, it's communication. It's about kind of transmitting an idea, and in this case, transmitting a, a kind of verbal textual idea, visually, you know, sort of encoding, encoding the words, essentially. So it's very important, the, the, the kind of uh, intertwining nature of, of word and image, and we're going to be focusing, uh, obviously, uh, a good deal on, uh, on that and, and I'm hoping some of the things which I'm, I'm going to be teaching will enable people to look differently at the at the text and maybe kind of uh, question and kind of think about in a, in a way which maybe they've never done before or mm. have not done as often. And Tolkien does seem to have like a unique or pretty unique relationship with art. I mean, I, I just have to. Yes, he's got to. Yeah. Yeah. I've got is my talking good? calendar here. Oh, yes, yes. With with a beautiful art we're from from Signum uh, alum yes. uh, Emily Austin nice. as well. So you know there's a Signum link here. Do yeah. do buy this calendar from all good uh, calendar shops. Um, but this you know, and I've got last year's as well. I mean, this is the Ted Naismith uh, calendar. 
it, it's such a rich history yes. of illustrations, isn't it? And, and it is, and it's many they it, it's for, for kind of for decades it's pushed the boundaries culturally, creatively. Uh, so obviously that we have uh, a certain um, kind of visuality. Uh, which we're probably most familiar with from from the movies and from the, you know, the likes of Alan E. John Howe, Ted Nugent, that those kind of characters. But there, I want people to realise there is a very wide kind of world out there, and th there is more than what we just generally see on, on the surface. So I'm hoping mm. to bring some um, some new material um, in, into the light, as it were, so uh, people can kind of appreciate the depth of of what's out there. So can you tell us uh, a bit about the kind of stuff that you 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 cover and and where you go? Do you go through chronologically? Do you go through well, thematically? Uh, not strict. It's not strictly chronological. Uh, it, it's not a, what I say. What it isn't. It's not an art appreciation course. It isn't a, a standard kind of chronology where we start at the beginning. So sort of Tolkien illustration just kind of move uh, through to the to the present day. The chronology is important because you need to be able to situate. Uh, the imagery in time and place as um, material objects, visual communication. But the idea what I'm trying to uh, emphasize is this idea of fostering a kind of comprehensive uh, research method, um, which we can apply to illustration. So covering both, uh, visual, contextual and critical angles to give uh, like a, a kind of holistic toolbox to equip people with um, mm. um, the skills to uh, examine uh, illustration from various theoretical angles. Okay, so through the twelve weeks, I'm going to be introducing try, tried and tested art historical uh, methodologies, some of which have been around for nearly a century, because I want people to understand that Tolkien illustration is not something which exists in a bubble. It is interlinked with the wider world of of art history, of visual culture, and uh, the paradigms and methodologies which enable people to study a Botticelli or a Picasso or a piece of classical, um, a classical wall painting can be applied to book illustration, can be applied to Tolkien illustration. There, 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 there's some differences, but it's the same world. OK, mm -hmm. so uh, over the over the 12 weeks, I'm going to be um, we're going to sort of working our way through beginning with a visual analysis for the first sort of three or four weeks where we look at um, formal properties of color, line, tone, composition, but also then move into subject matter, what we call iconography, where we look at who are these people in this in, in the image? What is the events? What's the story? How does it link with the written text? Mm -hmm. And then we'll move towards um, ideas of reception, context, how uh, socio-political factors can affect aesthetic choices. Um, and then, because I want this to be comprehensive, and then as we move to towards the end uh, of the course, we'll be looking at a kind of critical reflections, maybe how um, imagery can be related to um, ideas of race, of gender, kind of queer readings, um, so, uh, psychoanalytical readings, and, and the kind of non-artistic use of images, images as um, um, for kind of uh, uh, religious sexual reasons. And so there's a, there's a, there's a, wide, a wide world, okay? So we're, we're gonna be, dipping our toe into each bit. I'm not going to be overloading people with theory because obviously uh, there are other courses which will teach you the nuts and bolts of critical theory, etc. But we will be reflecting on these things. Well, that sounds incredibly useful and actually not just useful for studying Tolkien, but for studying so much, so many other topics, so much yeah, other exactly. literature. You can blow this out. It doesn't mm -hmm. have to be. It just happens. I'm, I'm concentrating on Tolkien illustration here, but it's almost like the steps we're doing now would be the steps that any art artist, uh, art historian at the beginning of their career would be learning. So you can then take this and apply it to some other um, yeah. uh, subject matter, some other field, some other historical period, etc. Because I, I think we all kind of relate to art and we know what we like, but it's very difficult to to talk about it or to to understand what's what the what yeah, is the artist actually doing here? Why why hard. what do we like about it? Yeah, yeah, and it can be hard to quantify. Mm -hmm. There are ways, there are methods, people have come up with methods where you can quantify certain things. There'll always be an elusive element, which is what makes it so interesting. But we can quantify, we can kind of, uh, there are approaches we can take to um, take things apart and to understand how, how these, these images work. Fantastic. Well, um, I, I actually I'd want to throw over, pass over to, to Sarah, because Sarah, you're a talking scholar 
Um, what what is your kind of viewpoint on this course and and also as chair of the the faculty? Uh, um, I, were you kind of instrumental in bringing this course about as well and finding Joel? I just say yes, you both. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to say that yes, as chair of faculty and Paul as dean, mm -hmm. we're both of us delighted that we've been able to secure Joel for this uh, course because I think that this will offer our students something really fresh, really different a great new perspective for our students on Tolkien's work. Um, but also, I mean, Joel's expertise in this area is absolutely top notch. Couldn't ask for better. Um, and as somebody who loves various illustrations of Tolkien, I mean, just take a look at this background, for example, you can spot how much I like Ted Naismith's work. Um, and another one I love is Donato Giancola, but, I know that there's way more artists out there that have been responding to Tolkien's work ever since it came out. Um, and I, for one, would actually love to know more about that. There are some that represent Tolkien's characters in very different ways. I'm thinking, for example, Joel of Core Block. Mm. Yes, yes mm. great Core Block. Yeah, very yeah. stripped down, um, uh, very minimalist. Um, the whole idea of, the, of his imagery, he was imagining a, a kind of um, a sort of faux medieval society living on a little island called Barbarussia. And this was their, um, essentially, this was their kind of medieval art. These were their manuscript illustrations. So we're getting kind of all sorts of interesting um, elements with his work. Yeah, mm -hmm. so we'll be looking at him. Yeah, so I think that this is a wonderful addition to our Tolkien course catalogue. Uh, and I'm really delighted. Uh, I think the students who participate in this course are going to have a really wonderful semester with Joel. Yeah, absolutely. It, and it's fascinating also because it, it opens up all this discussion about interpretation and adaptation. I mean, Core Block, I believe Tolkien was a fan of, of was, Block's yes, work yeah, as well. He did purchase uh, several of his, of his images. Yeah, and it, and if you just saw Block's work on its own, you might think, oh, well, that's not very Tolkien, that's not authentic, that's not kind of close to the source material or whatever. I mean, it's it's certainly an interpretation, but well, then... Kind of graphically, we'll find it is very close in places. Right. Very, very close to the to the material. Interesting, mm -hmm. yeah. And yeah. and I think I think Tolkien also liked Pauline Bain's um, yes, yes. illustration. I mean, she did a map of Middle-earth, didn't she? Yes, and then she did these kind of... Earth, which has yeah, been very and influential. I, I, uh, I will mention that uh, there's a number of artists who've who've gone back to that map and taken elements. Uh, Japanese artist uh, Ryuji Terashima used um, uh, motifs from that map for the first Japanese translation images, uh, which is another thing we might we will be looking at. Amazing. So it's just it's all kind of opening up, and there's so much to talk about and yeah, so much to learn. Everywhere, everywhere you look, there's somebody borrowing from someone. It's similar to the world, you know, the, the kind of literary world, I suppose, that Tolkien was. Mm. I that's amazing mm, well I, I, I like the fact that we're going to actually have the opportunity to apply critical theory to the visual um and i think that's a real opportunity for our students actually um because every time we look at um an artist's rendition of something from tolkien's work we're seeing tolkien's work through that person's eyes uh, and I think that's fascinating yeah. uh, you because you don't, sorry to interrupt. You don't always have to agree with that person, which is the, no, uh, but to see it and yeah. to see how so many different people have seen Tolkien's work in so many different ways. I think that's just really interesting to do. So um, welcome, Joel, to the Signum family. We're delighted to have you. Brilliant. Absolutely, and I, I I I wish I could just talk to you all day about about this course, but then it would turn into a lecture, and you know, yeah, if you want a lecture, you have to sign up for the course. <laughs> um, but just but just briefly, um, uh, maybe you could just comment on on the assignments. What kind of assignments are, yeah, are you? We, what we do students three, expect? Three assignments. So it's going to be um uh, an initial kind of early on. I think around, around about week four or five, there'll be a short written paper which will be using um. The, the formal uh, methodology, which I'll be introducing in week three to just analyze a single illustration. Okay, so you'll be looking at, there's various principles of formal analysis, which I'll be talking about. And the idea of this first essay, um, the students will choose a, a talking illustration of you know, whichever they want from whoever they want, and they'll apply the formal analysis in this kind of short paper. 
Uh, then there's going to be um, a visual report which will be due some, around about the middle uh, uh, of the of the uh, the course. Uh, so this is essentially it'll be um, combining kind of oral and a visual sort of presentation element. So essentially, uh, students have a 10 minute presentation with slides. So obviously, there has to be a visual. There has to be some kind of imagery involved, uh, in which the 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 choice of subject matter is quite broad. They can talk about something we've we've mentioned in class or an image we've mentioned in class. They can talk about um, one of the readings, or they can be looking at uh, their own sort of choice of images or things which maybe will be um, incorporated into the final essay. Okay, so that'll be a ten-minute presentation with uh, a, a question and answer session, uh, five minutes of question and answer afterwards, and uh, the final essay is. Um, it's uh, it's another piece of this time it's comprehensive analysis. So um, around about I think uh, I'm going to cut this fairly short, but around about week seven we're going to be looking at the work of a, a cultural historian called A.B. Warburg, and he created um, something called his Nemesine Atlas, which was essentially it was a huge project where he would paste um, hundreds of images onto boards from different time periods where he believed there was some kind of kind of recurring. Uh, motif uh, involved and he would trace kind of links between the ages um, and tell a story over uh, uh, you know, a, a number of images. So I'm going to condense this down and what I want students to do is essentially to get to choose three uh, free images, uh, Tolkien illustrations from three different time periods and um, give a, a comprehensive analysis of each one. So there'll be visual contextual analysis and the three images need to be have a kind of overarching linking theme so you tell a story across uh, using these three images and I would like ideally to, for there to be some kind of critical angle um, to this to this essay so you're telling a critical story you could say across using three images as the as the kind of canvas um, wow so okay well that that sounds brilliant thank you so yeah. much for sharing that so that yeah Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Joel. It's it's such a pleasure to meet you and to, and uh, reiterate, um, uh, Dr. Peterson and Dr. Brown, we're so happy to have you Thank giving you. this course. Uh, and I think the students are going to benefit from this so much. Uh, just a reminder, if you're joining us live in the Zoom session, please do uh, leave your comments in the chat or your questions in the Q&A. You can also ask questions in the chat. Uh, but uh, let, let us know what you're thinking uh, and whether you've signed up for any classes yet or whether you're still on the fence. Uh, we've got one comment. I've already enrolled in enrolled in this class. Can't wait for it to start on May the 1st. Brilliant. So there you go. To, uh, seeing you. Yeah, absolutely. Excellent. Well, let's move on because we've got um, three other classes to talk about as well. And our next class is... Uh, H.P. Lovecraft, Literary Copernicus. Um, so this is actually going to be a fascinating one for us to think about because we're doing something that we've never done before at Sydney University, which is that we're taking a course that was pre-recorded uh, quite a few years ago now. I think it was 2015. And uh, we are updating some of the lectures just to um, bring the whole course up to date. Um, so the original course was delivered by the absolutely brilliant scholar, Dr. Amy H. Sturgis. If you've ever taken uh, a Dr. Sturgis class, you know how um, fantastic her ability to communicate is, uh, share so much knowledge, so much enthusiasm, have so much fun. And she has a huge amount of fun with this course because she really loves the work of H.P. Lovecraft. Uh, what we are doing is we're going to be doing a whole new first lecture for week one. Lecture two and week one will be the same as it was before. Uh, lecture three and four in week two will also be brand new. And then we'll rejoin the class as it was originally recorded until week 12. And then the very last two lectures in week 12 will also be brand new. I say brand new. We're also actually going to have clips of Dr. Sturgis talking from the original lectures in lecture one and lecture 12, um, because she has this wonderful summary of the whole course in lecture, uh, not lecture 12, week 12, uh, lecture 24. 
Um, so we're going to retain that. And then we've also got uh, a clip of her speaking from the very first lecture that's going to be in the new first lecture. So it's going to be um, a kind of augmentation, not a replacement. It's um, bringing stuff up to date. And what we're doing really is adding texts that have been released since Dr. Sturgis gave that course originally uh, in 2015. So um, things like uh, Victor Laval's The the Ballad of Black Tom, which is an incredible novella um, based on a short story by H.P. Lovecraft, but told from the perspective of one of the Black characters uh, in it. Um, and so this is um, a really interesting um, retelling of Lovecraft that also grapples with uh, Lovecraft's racism, because Lovecraft had um, racist uh, and... Um, anti-Semitic views in his private life. Some of these come through in his stories as well. Um, so this is actually a, like a big topic that we're grappling with in this revised course, especially this updated course. It was in the original course too uh, that Dr. Sturgis talked about. But what's different is that now we've got more writers and creators who are sort of responding to this issue. How do we um, read Lovecraft knowing his racist views and, and how do we respond to those? Um, the thing is, uh, Lovecraft is so important to cosmic horror. So you can't really think about cosmic horror and Lovecraft separately. Uh, and if you're not sure what cosmic horror is, this is Cthulhu, the great, uh, one of the, the elder gods. Um, cosmic horror is basically a type of horror that has a massive scale to it. Um, one of the horrifying things is that we are so small and insignificant in the universe. And the, the great elder gods like Cthulhu, and he is scarier <laughs> than this plushie, I'll show you, um, is, uh, is, is sort of, he's gonna crush us and not even like think about us. That's how unimportant we are. So it's a kind of like existential dread as well as um, a kind of physical horror, if you like. And that's, that's a sort of, beginnings of cosmic horror there's a lot more to it than that there's secrets there's secret societies there's conspiracies there's um you know ancient beings that have been living under the surface of the uh of the the earth or coming from like far away across the stars um uh it but that's basically what it's about and it's so much fun, so brilliant to to read and to think about. And Lovecraft is so important in that history. You know, he he basically invented that genre, uh, or that it sort of came out of weird fiction. So um, we're going to be thinking about all these issues about Lovecraft's racism, about kind of the interaction between a writer and his work, um, but also just having so much fun. We get to read all these amazing cosmic horror stories we get to discuss these big topics we get to do something that is really up to the minute we've got um as well as uh, the ballad of black tom we've got a short story from she walks in shadows you don't have to buy this whole book we'll we'll supply just the short story for you as a pdf um and also um a short story from this book as well so the short story is lavi tidha and also we have uh, Premi Mohammed's uh, short story from this uh, anthology. We're reading as well um, H.P. Lovecraft's uh, um, Supernatural Horror in, in uh, Literature, uh, which I have somewhere, so I'm sort of surrounded by books. Um, and we have uh, The Willows, which is a short story that really inspired Lovecraft. We're also going to be looking at the BBC audio dramatization of uh, Charles Dexter Ward, which is a fascinating adaptation. We've got also the Color Out of Space film, um, which, uh, quite recent, uh, which is also amazing. And we've got the first two episodes of Lovecraft Country to look at, which again is a, is a fascinating sort of um, interpretation of Lovecraft that, uh, that again sort of takes into account his racism and responds to it in really interesting uh, and important ways. Um, so that was a, a, a lot of information to share about this course, but as I say, we're doing something quite different with it. Um, uh, and uh, questions in the chat, will we have the opportunity to attend the new lectures live? Yes, you will. 
uh, we are going to be giving those new lectures as live in weeks one, two, and 12. Um, in order to really kind of keep that feeling of this being a course with live lectures, because that's what the original course was, even though it's pre-recorded, those lectures were originally given live. So we didn't we wanted the, the new lectures to fit in seamlessly with the pre-recorded lectures from 2015. Uh, and I should also say that Dr. Sturgis has given us a very kind blessing for these uh, new new lectures. Uh, we've told us uh, we, she, we've told her of our plans. And um, so it's really kind of a great sort of collaborative effort. Uh, although any problems in the new lectures are entirely down to the new lectures, which is myself and Dr. Maggie Park. Uh, so uh, just to, to um, uh, excuse Dr. Sturgis from any problems that we might introduce, but hopefully we won't introduce any. Uh, and we're approaching this course with a lot of respect for the original course and a lot of love for the work of Lovecraft and cosmic horror. So if you've got any more questions or any responses from other panelists, I'm happy to respond to those. Um, but I think it's going to be lots of fun. It's also great to have 12 weeks where you can spend on just one author, um, which isn't always the case of just Dr. Brown and myself have just precepted um, the Gothic tradition course, which is also an amazing Dr. Amy Sturgis course, but that goes through a lot of time, a lot of different formats and authors over 12 weeks. And now we get to spend 12 weeks really just on one author and one kind of subgenre. Um, so that means that we can go into lots and lots of detail um, and really spend our time with it. Um, last time I precepted this course, I gave students the opportunity to share their dreams with <laughs> fellow students. We had a kind of collaborative dream diary because dreams are really important for Lovecraft and they actually feature in a lot of his work. And I thought it'd be interesting to record our dreams. It's completely optional, I should say. But if you want to keep a record of what happens in your dreams during the course, it's actually quite fascinating to see the fiction that we're reading start to creep into our minds. And, and also as our subconscious sort of shifts through the uh, eldritch secrets within. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, do, do join us for that course. It's going to be a lot of fun and it's going to be really, really interesting. Shall we move on to the next course, um, unless there are any more questions or comments? Um, hope we don't have any nightmares, says one person in the chat. Absolutely, I'm sure you won't. Uh, let's move on to something a little less horrific. The Inklings and King Arthur. Uh, so this was a course that was lectured on by myself and Dr. Maggie Park with um, some lectures given by Serena Higgins as well, and uh, Dr. Higgins is the editor of this book, The Inklings and King Arthur, which is kind of the textbook of this course, and we're delighted to have Dr. Sarah Brown as the preceptor of this course this term. So, Dr. Brown, what can you tell us about The Inklings and King Arthur? Well, um, apart from the fact that the uh, the lectures uh, by you and Dr. Higgins and Dr. Park are wonderful lectures um, which, from which I've been learning a lot, um, I approached this simply because I knew that Tolkien had written so much about King Arthur um, and, of course, had worked on um, his own version of King Arthur, the King Arthur story, but also because I was aware that there are tropes from the King Arthur story that wind their way through Tolkien's work. But of course, I'm a Tolkien scholar, not an inkling scholar. And so I hadn't really thought about all those other inklings that uh, Tolkien worked alongside, who were just as fascinated with King Arthur. So what this course is going to offer is the opportunity to um, look at the ways in which other inklings, like, of course, C.S. Lewis, Charles Williams, etc., the, the ways in which they all, this entire group of men, were fascinated with the story of King Arthur. Uh, why was this? What was the, the, the real draw for them in this story? And why can we see elements of the King Arthur stories um, going through all of their work? 
So we're going to be having a look at that. Um, and also this course offers the opportunity to look at the work of other writers, um, medieval, Victorian, other 20th century Arthurian writers, um, and that will let us look at the Inklings work in the context of other literary approaches to the Arthurian idea. Um, and also will uh, help us to look at why it is that they just kept coming back to the King Arthur story. So that's really what the course is going to explore. You're going to get lots of King Arthur. You're going to get lots of the Inklings. Um, but you're going to get lots of other stories in which we look for the similar themes, ideas, uh, narrative tropes. Um, that you find in these works, but you find them in other people's works as well, some of which might be surprising to you. So, yeah, absolutely. And by the end of the course, we really open out. Um, so actually, you know, Harry Potter's on on the course right at the end. Exactly. Um, you know, it Harry Potter's not Arthurian, and yet some of those elements are actually kind of similar. And so you can start to think about well, what are the kind of the building blocks? of Arthurian literature, of fantasy literature as well. Maybe we could sort of trace fantasy back to these earlier tales about King Arthur. Um, perhaps before we go any further, perhaps you could you could just sort of explain who were the Inklings and who was King Arthur? Um, because we probably people have heard of these names, but actually, you know, what what, what are we really talking about here? Okay, fair enough. Well, uh, who was King Arthur? Well, that's an excellent question, actually. Um, and the person to ask that is always going to be Dr. Sheng, who is a, a real um, Arthur specialist. Um, so King Arthur is, um, he is a, a really interesting, but hard to pin down person in that he's, he's there in our history's but he seems to be all over the place. So there's places in Cornwall, places in Wales that all claim to be the birth seat of King Arthur. But there seems to be this figure um, way, way back centuries and centuries ago um, that was a focus for um, the people of the time as like the, the hero of the time. I know that, uh, Gabriel, you can expand far more on that. Um, Go on, you tell us. Well, I don't. Oh, oh, gosh, oh. I mean, we 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 could we could discuss this and debate this for hours, right. can we? Um, so one one thing I think people sometimes make a mistake of when thinking about Arthur is they want, you know, they just they just want a simple answer. Who was King Arthur? He was this bloke who lived in this time, and actually, no. Um, mm -hmm. So the way I talk about Arthur in the Return of King Arthur course, and a little bit in this course as well is that it's like trying to find the source of the Nile. Um, mm -hmm. If you, you you can make an argument that Lake Victoria um, is the source of the River Nile, or you can make a, an argument that um, the Blue Nile in Ethiopia is the source of the Nile. But actually, neither is really the Nile. What makes up the Nile is all the tributaries, all the different sources that feed in. And at some point, possibly in Sudan or Egypt or, or, or indeed in Ethiopia or Uganda, you say, well, that's the Nile. That's recognizable as the Nile. And that's the point about Arthur. It's, he may have existed at some point in the mists of time, but really it's all the stories about this legendary king um, that feed in. And I love the illustration of this course, which is done by a talking illustrator, Emily Austin, to go back to uh, your area of expertise, Joel. Um, we have different elements here. We've got the sword Excalibur, we've got the Holy Grail, we've got um, Castle, possibly Camelot. Uh, and these are all sort of like kind of um, reefed in mist, uh, which is actually smoke coming out of a pipe, um, which is a very inkling thing. So there's, it, 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 there's no easy answer to what is Arthur. Um, but actually what we do, we spend, I think, the first three or four weeks of this course just reading different versions of the Arthur story from medieval writers. Uh, we don't say there is one version of Arthur. We talk about the Arthur of the Welsh, the Arthur of the French, the Arthur of the English. Um, and actually, there's lots of complexity in all of these things. But, but you get to read bits of the Mabinogion. You get to read um, bits of Sir Thomas Malley and Chrétien de Troyes. Um, so if, you, if you're coming into this course with no background in King Arthur, don't worry. 
-hmm. we spend some time at the beginning of this course getting everyone up to speed because the Inklings did know about King Arthur. And then they that's why they kind of fed those stories into their own stories. So so briefly, Sarah, what who were the Inklings then? Well, the Inklings were a particular group of scholars, academics, um, all in Oxford, who would meet very regularly um, at a couple of pubs. Um, of course, most people will have heard of the Bird and Baby, the Eagle and Child, but also the Lamb and Flag just across the road. They would uh, patronise either of those. But they would come together and they would share their creativity. So if they'd been working on something, they would read it to each other. They would get feedback. Some of that feedback was friendlier than other feedback. Um, so sometimes the, friend, the, uh, the feedback could be quite blunt. But we're talking about people like Tolkien, of course, C.S. Lewis, and then the ones that are possibly slightly less read than Tolkien and Lewis, Owen Barfield, Charles Williams, those are the four main members of the Inklings. Um, so they were great friends. They shared similar tastes, usually, in literature. They had similar interests, anyway. Um, and um, that's not to say that they all completely agreed with each other's writing all the time, because they absolutely did not but they're all really interesting in their own way. They all approached uh, life, philosophy, religion, and creativity in very individual ways. So that's why they're all worth looking at, it, because they all had their own ideas about Arthur. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think this is maybe the only course that we do that enables you to study all these authors together and think mm. about them as a group, as a movement. Um, and again, just for like with King Arthur, we're, we're complicating the story because this is master's level course. This isn't about just saying, oh, this is the answer. This is about getting us to engage with these ideas. What do we mean by a literary group? To what extent were the Inklings like a group that influenced each other? Um, there's different scholarly kind of thoughts on this. Um, people like... Uh, um, Diane Glyer and um, Humphrey Carpenter had different ideas about this. Who were the main people in the Inklings? Um, you've mentioned four. I would absolutely agree with you, Sarah, but um, sometimes poor Owen Barfield gets left out. Yes, um, one thing we do in this course is actually bring Roger Lancelin Green in to, mm -hmm. to the, the, the main area of Inklings. He's quite an important figure. He came up with the name Chronicles of Narnia for, for C.S. Lewis, for example, and uh, wrote... Uh, a, a version of the Arthurian legend, uh, which was also quite influential in its own way. So, yeah, the, who are the Inklings and who are King Arthur? I kind of threw that at you as as if it were an easy question, and of yeah. course, it's... who's King Arthur? Well, I will tell you. I have two minutes, and there's no if, problem if, with giving you the only. Exact Yes. If only we knew. Well, um, hopefully we'll get a time machine at some point and we can actually get definite answers to these questions. But in the meantime, we actually get to grapple with um, these these sort of fascinating concepts. And so that's what you will be able to do in this course. And um, yeah, do, can you comment on the assignments at all, uh, Sarah? Yep, sure. Um, so uh, as is quite usual with courses with me there will be a short paper um, and that will actually be due at the end of week three and it will be based on the readings for the first three weeks uh, that will be about 1500 words there will be a longer paper um, and that will be based on everything in the 12 week course and that will be due actually right at the end of the course now, what I normally have done is oral exams in the week after the end of semester. But here's the thing. The summer semester is already 13 weeks because of the one week break in the middle. So what I've decided to do this time around uh, is that I'm going to still do the same kind of idea for oral presentations. But when the students sign up for a week um during the course which I often have anyway students sign up to do a five to ten minute presentation they will be 10 to 15 minute presentations instead and they will be the ones that count towards your actual uh, oral grade so those will be the three main assessments alongside the usual things like participation and all those other things that are really important 
Uh, and yes, I do lurk on the discussion forum to see who is there and who is not there. Fantastic. Well, that sounds like so much fun. And uh, we've got a great conversation in the chat. Takaka is suggesting that maybe the great Cthulhu could help us find out who Arthur is. Uh, we're using uh, the eldritch secrets of the elder yeah, well, ones. You go ahead and ask him, but I'm not going to sacrifice anything personal to get the answer. Just saying. Um, but if you're interested in this, because everything's related, there is an anthology of short stories that's just come out called Lovecraft in a Time of Madness, and that includes a version of the King Arthur story told as cosmic horror, so told in the style of H.P. Lovecraft. So it does exist. Um, the Arthur legend is so malleable. Uh, if you can imagine it, someone's probably written it. Um, and uh, yeah, exactly. He's a sleeping king. <laughs> <laughs> That's absolutely right. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Um, anyway, let's move on. But thank you so much, Dr. Brown, for that um, amazing explanation. And again, another exciting course. And let's talk about our fourth extremely exciting course, Intro to Old Norse, one of our language courses. Um, Dr. Peterson, apologies, you're always left last, but it's it's so that we, you know, you you can shine the brightest uh, yeah. and, and tell us all about your language courses. We we love coming last because we <laughs> like to go back in time and you know we're set. You know we we stop at the year thirteen hundred, so that's perfect. Like we should always come last. But um, yeah, I mean we're excited. Intro to Old Norse. This is our most successful course apparently now at Signum for the second time it's been offered. Why? I mean. As an old narcissist, I can't explain why it's why I love what I love. I can't explain why other people love it either. It's it's a language course that used to be offered at many more places. You know, it's been kind of minimized, relegated to the sidelines in most academic circles, and that's okay. Like we like that people have to come to Signum more often. You know, to take a course that used to be offered at more places. Um, but it's a it's a great. Um, uh, language course. It was lectured originally by Carl Edlund Anderson, um, another resident Old Norse expert. Um, he and I will both be handling some preceptor sessions for the course. Um, so it, it, it's run about half of the course. The first uh, six weeks or so um, will be dedicated to grammar, which we still teach things semi-traditionally. We do a, a run through, you know, parts of speech, syntax, um, before we do any hardcore translating. Um, and then the second half of the course is, is translation focused. Um, we have no papers for the course, which is nice. Some people might find that to be a relief, but you don't get away from a lot of kind of daily exercises. Um, so we have graded, graded weekly uh, assignments, um, two exams, uh, a midterm and a final. Um, a, an oral presentation. We we still like to do those, even if we don't have a paper that's attached to it, just to have a, a chance for people to speak up and um, delve into a topic of interest. Um, but why why Old Norse is so popular? Um, it, it seems to be that that um, you know people from all angles can appreciate a language that was influential in you know fantasy literature it's still popular in medieval circles um it's it, it's a part of the history of the english language um i'm a scandinavian background person i'm actually american but um it kind of seems like it's part of the history of scandinavia as well i mean it's the the historical language but it's really old icelandic that we focus on that's kind of the misnomer old norse makes it sound more like it's the study of this of this language that was centered in all the modern Scandinavian countries and it is kind of but it's artificial um, we're we're primarily looking at literature produced in Iceland in the 13th and 14th centuries and that's the draw that's where all of the um, uh, great great intellectual minds of the 19th and 20th century people were interested in this this old Icelandic literature um, also looking at the myths um, of, of Norse mythology we know that Vikings are very popular so this is not exactly the language of the Vikings the Vikings spoke a form of kind of pre Old Norse um, uh, so what we define as Old Norse is is a little bit more concretely um, post-Viking age, um, but 
we can sell that in a popular sense and be like study the language of the Vikings, but that's that's just to to sell more books. So certain authors have had um, textbooks like Viking language. Um, one of them is a, is an American colleague of mine, um, and it's not the Viking language that you study when you learn Old Norse. You're you're learning a, a language that does have literature that can be dated back to that time, poetry that's been preserved from the Viking Age. Um, it would have still been intelligible, um, but it's several centuries after the Viking Age that, that this language output takes off. During the High Middle Ages um, in the North, they were more reflective looking at antiquity, their own antiquity, kind of a, a, a weird hybrid, um, you know, where epic and romance is taking off on the continent and in Britain. Um, they're looking a little bit more at their own history and kind of developing their own storytelling style. Um, somewhat fashioned after um, several, uh, I think, um, British styles, um, like old Irish sagas uh, are kind of one of the possible, um, the oral storytelling abilities um, that they may have been transmitted through interaction during the Viking Age with Scandinavians settling and conquering um, and eventually leaving those places uh, of conquest along the way, um, but they brought a lot of those traditions with them to Iceland in particular, and that's where it really takes off, where you have the blend of oral tradition, written tradition, and all kinds of medieval influences coming in from, from learned continental Europe, um, and all of it taking off um, in this remote place. Uh, and a lot of it, we also look at manuscripts. We do learn how to read directly from manuscripts scripts to some extent as we're learning the language, um, but it, it sets up people to be able to take our continuation course, course, uh, uh, Edic Poetry, which is, you know, depending on one's taste or preference, you know, perhaps the most valuable literature of, of Old Norse, um, the Old Norse language. So we look in the, um, in the second semester, um, the continuation, we would look at um, the poems and actually read a good number of them in the original. Um, from manuscripts directly. And, and that's really tough to do um, without the, the beginning course where you learn uh, essentially how to read prose primarily and um, learning the building blocks, the, the Legos or Lincoln logs, I like to use toy metaphors, um, for how to understand the structure of the language. Because Old Norse is complex, um, it's not as complex as other languages around the world, um, but it is it, it, it has some grammar to it that we don't have in, say, modern English. Um, so there are four cases, three genders. Um, there are many more verbal forms, and adjectives can decline, and there are many more verb conjugations to, to learn, but um, we kind of take an intermediate approach of, you know, part memorization, part just kind of learning the art of philology, which is where this is sort of centered, which is the art of knowing where to look stuff up. Um, it's not memorization for its own sake. It's kind of knowing, memorizing which uh, reference work you need to pull out at the right time and how to get an answer quickly. So it's not always um, rote memorization. That's not the way that we teach any of our language courses. Um, but it's okay for people to study a little extra if they want to uh, do rote memorization, but we don't in encourage it. Um, we encourage kind of, um, here are resources, here's ways to get a quicker answer. And over time, you do start to synthesize, um, you know, the complexity of languages and know where to look up the form um, in record time. And with uh, with uh, things on the internet these days, like Wiktionary, which is an amazing resource that I can tell you even five years ago was not very good. Um, you can look up and get your answers quicker and quicker as time goes on. I don't know if there are a lot of grad students who have nothing better to do, but these have been edited with full conjugations and declensions um, where you can type in a word if you don't know it, get an instant um, gloss of it, and also all of the, the verb, um, all of the forms of that word. So that's kind of a new thing that's that's been improved since this course was recorded, I think, in um, 2016, I believe. Um, we don't plan to redo it yet, um, but someday we may. Um, but currently, it, it's still pretty nice and functional as is with the with the old lectures. And um, I think it works pretty well. We, we meet twice a week. Um, that's something language courses do. That's a little different than literature courses. For preceptor sessions, we meet um, for two one-hour sessions. 
Um, so we get a little bit more hands-on in that sense um, because we we have to. Language requires a little bit more um, meeting times, I guess, to internalize the information. It's it's not to say that literature couldn't also sometimes use a little more than an hour, but um, in language, it's it's critical. Um, there's we'd love to meet seven days a week if we could um, for language study. Um, that would be the ideal way. Um, so then we would have everyone would be an expert at Old Norse uh, by the end of 12 weeks, uh, meeting seven times a week. But um, so yeah, that's kind of our our course. It's a it's an oldie but a goodie. Um, very popular again. Um, I think it's it's almost going to tie its record from the pandemic year 2020, uh, where we had, uh, I think, nearly 30 something students, which is the, officially the largest Old Norse program on planet Earth. Um, so yeah, and I know all the circles of Old Norse programs all around the world, and we have more at Signum, more students at Signum, and we're proud of that. Uh, it's a really, uh, you know, it's a really um, great opportunity to expand our students, you know, interest into something that's kind of a foundational outside weird, but foundational skill, I guess, especially in fantasy literature, Tolkien studies. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, we kind of teach it from all perspectives, you know, we're just general medievalists and um, philologists and fantasy lit fans and all of it. Um, so we're kind of coming from a lot of angles. Oh. Fantastic. And yeah, you mentioned the the popularity of this course. I mean, we're, we're um, so excited to have so many people signed up for all four of these courses already. Um, but um, there is still a few weeks to go before the uh, the beginning of the term. Um, but um, yeah, intro to Old Norse has had a very healthy response. And th that suggests to me that there's going to be a really great community um, for this course as well, because that's that's one of the things. Yeah, it's not just about the... Um, the, the weekly meetings that you have or bi-weekly meetings in this case uh, it's also the discussion board where you get to talk to uh, your fellow students um, as much as you like really and and uh, I, as a teacher you know I, I agree with you Dr. Brown we read everything uh, we're always there lurking but it's great it's very um, gratifying for us to see friendships blossom and people sort of become future colleagues of each other and sort of exchange ideas and help each other out as well um because i i imagine you know t learning old norse for the first time it might be a little bit daunting but you've got this great community to help you um and and so that kind of leads me to my question which is which is that this is called intro to old norse is this something that you can really do having not done any old norse before like is this kind of norse 101 is this like designed to be like that so this is officially open to all and any language experience, which could be from zero to a hundred. So, so one could be an expert in Sanskrit or Latin or Greek. Great, that'll be helpful, but not required. So this is designed to be as democratic as possible, um, teaching to those with no language experience. Um, it's helpful sometimes to maybe review parts of speech and, and kind of some basic linguistic background, but we do provide that. Um, but I mean, it never hurt anyone to study the most basics of, 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 you know, for example, just knowing a little more about English. But my favorite thing is that for beginners with no language experience, they learn more about their native language when they're studying a second or a third or fourth mm -hmm. language. Um, so it, it kind of that process is built in. Um, so we we don't mind. We in fact love and encourage anyone, regardless of language abilities or experience. Uh, so we do not have a a, a bar. Uh, the bar is you exist as a human being. <laughs> that is it. So that's brilliant. Absolutely fantastic. And um, the the other thing, I, you know, sometimes I feel like I need to explain, especially for people who are a bit more new to Sigmund University, you might look at these four courses and you think, wait, well, right, you're doing kind of Tolkien illustration, you're doing Inklings of King Arthur, H.P. Lovecraft, intro to Old Norse. This is such a an eclectic mix, but actually it really, it, it all makes sense. And it is actually sort of all bound together by that one man, J.R.R. Tolkien. Um, so, you know, the, obviously the illustrating the Tolkien course, that's very much related to Tolkien, the Inklings and King Arthur. Tolkien wrote about King Arthur, and this is about the group that he belonged to, the Inklings. Um, he read H.P. Lovecraft, uh, and actually there's not a huge difference between 
um, fantasy literature and cosmic horror or weird fiction, uh, which uh, Lovecraft was writing. And even you could make a case that there are elements of cosmic horror in Tolkien's Legendarium. And then Old Norse, um, let's not forget Tolkien was a philologist. He was a an expert on on these ancient languages. So it's I, I I do sometimes think that if Tolkien invented a curriculum or a university, it actually might end up looking quite like Signum University, even though he'd be baffled by the online aspect of it. Um, but do do you, do you see a link there, um, Dr. Peterson, between Tolkien as an academic and the kind of courses we offer at Signum University? Yeah, we we pride ourselves on being able to kind of offer the background to Tolkien studies, which is Tolkien's profession, which is sort of mm -hmm. the inspiration for much of much of his 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 literature. Um, we know him also as a philologist, and he you know um, we read uh, his scholarship. Um, we're informed by it. I, I mean, we kind of come in on the side, so to speak. We come in with his background. Um, several of us have the same training as him, essentially, myself and and um, Nelson and Carl. We we love um, Tolkien, um, you know, as as professionals, uh, but we also love him, you know, as individuals. And and um, so it, it does all tie together. It's kind of the background of, of, you know, one of the most foundational authors of fantasy literature, um, that kind of you know, is it, it's important. How did he get there? Um, we know that he's brilliant as an author, but he was also quite good as a philologist, just a regular old academic, boring academic. I mean, like the rest of us. Um, but yeah, I mean, so that's, it does all tie together. It's the, the program, you know, this was founded by Dr. Corey Olson and, and it's really, it's a Tolkien centric university. Um, but we've, we've kind of branched out within our concentration areas. And these, these include, you know, philology on the side, so to speak. We also have a, a small classical uh, wing as well. And we're kind of working mm -hmm. on that for the future. Um, but yeah, I mean, we're kind of, and that, that informs Tolkien quite a lot as well. Um, but yeah, it's, it's all of the above. Um, we're not, we're not limiting ourselves. We're kind of, we're open to these expanded, <clears throat> expanded areas. Um, and that's, that's what we want to do. So, yeah, yep. absolutely. And it's, it's, it's great and exciting and, uh, so much fun to be part of that process. Uh, we've got a great comment in the chat. Wish I had three clones and a fatter wallet so I could manage all four courses this term. They all sound fascinating. Seriously, considering it considering an audit at least so of course just as a reminder you can audit these courses which means that you get to take part in the discussion um but you don't have to do the assignment so that's uh, a good option if you if you're not sure about your own time but if you are um uh, interested in taking the assignments and a lot of the, the people who do the audits sometimes by the end they kind of they go oh well maybe i should have done the assignments as well because um then they get to um potentially you know have this class count towards uh, a diploma or uh, an MA um, it, it, it can count as credit for those and the assignments are quite fun as well they're hard work but they're fun uh, and so uh, we encourage if you're on the fence to just sign up and give it a go and um, the, the the most difficult thing I think is making a choice as as always. So um, we've come to the end of our time but we do like to end with a quick um, going around the room everyone choosing one course that they would take if they could take a course as a teacher um but as a student if that makes sense so um you can't choose your own course um i'm gonna i'm gonna go first and actually mine's really difficult because, well in many ways mine's easier because i basically have two courses almost this term because i lectured on uh the, um, the inkling is a king arthur and i'm precepting on hp lovecraft so i can't choose either of those I'm always super, super, super tempted by the language courses, and particularly this one because it just sounds so foundationally useful as well. Like it just, I can see so many areas that that would be really, really useful for my own scholarship and studies. Um, but I can also see that being the case for Dr. Mariner's course, um, uh, uh, the Talking Illustrated course. So um, I'm, I'm really split between the two, but I might go for the Talking Illustrated. Um, uh, but uh, I could, I would be very, very happy in either of those. So Joel, perhaps you could comment uh, which which course would you take? I'm, I think I'm going to have to go for the Norse because uh, I, I keep finding 
illustrations with uh, runic inscriptions and things like this and I really wish I could easily translate them. Oh, excuse my dog is barking in the background. Yes, I think it would have to be uh, have to be the, the, the Norse. Excellent. Um, Paul, what about you? Oh, Joel's course sounds awesome. <clears throat> Hands down, that would be the one I would take. It, it's it's new. It's fresh. We need it. We need it. it it's so brilliant. I, I, I almost, if I had the time, I have three jobs, so I can't, but if I had the time, I would take it for real. Um, and I look forward to probably auditing it after the fact when I do have time. No. Absolutely. Uh, Sarah. Um, well, I keep telling myself as a Tolkien scholar, I really ought to be taking or at least auditing some of these wonderful language courses because it's kind of shameful that I've never taken anything philological at all and one of these days it's going to happen but I have to say I, I would be right in that Tolkien illustrated course this this semester because it's it really speaks to me. I love um, actually looking at all these different illustrations of Tolkien's work anyway. Um, and let's not forget that Tolkien himself was an illustrator. So I would be voting for Joel, I'm afraid. But it's this is like asking somebody who their favorite child is, Gabriel. I know, I know. Every single time. I know, but that's what makes it such a fun question. Right, uh. yeah. <laughs> Because, I mean, cosmic horror as well, yeah. you know, it's, uh, it's creepy, but good, right? Exactly. Creepy, but good. That's a great tagline for that course. Um, excellent. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you to all my panelists, um, all the teachers this term. Of course, we have some other teachers who couldn't make this, um, this panel discussion, but uh, they'll also be teaching next term. And thank you so much to all of you for watching this and participating uh, in the live Zoom session, but also on YouTube. Um, do leave a comment down below if you have any questions or comments, uh, and be sure to smash that like button and hit subscribe or whatever whatever it is I'm supposed to be saying. Um, but thank you so much, and have a great term at Sigmund University. Uh, it's going to be lots of fun and very, very rewarding and useful. Um, and uh, look forward to seeing you in the classroom. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great uh, rest of your day. Bye-bye.